Hi everyone, my name is Mel. I started recording videos of my talk and suddenly I felt that it was not the most appropriate way to communicate. Uh, it was coming as too much of a personal interaction and what I'm guided to share is not personal at all. So I decided to simply record some soundtracks and let the words and the energy behind them to do its work. I don't want to bore you with a long talk, so I will be splitting that talk into three chapters. One will be childhood and its relation to the pranic illumination. Second it will be about the COVID-19 and I will use it as an opportunity to address disease, life and death. And third, a transition towards the pranic state by harnessing hydrogen and create an alternative ATP energy source as a bridge to a pranic state. So if you find any subject boring or irrelevant, just go ahead and fast forward to the next one. I also break the chapters with some clips of non-verbal human contact through touch and body movement. The essence of life across the universe is based on abundance. Everything is alive and pulsing and we can communicate with everything, even what we consider as inanimate. Let's talk about childhood. I perceive childhood not as an age definition, but as a state of pranic consciousness. A specific vibrational frequency, which is archetypally linked to creation, the expression of illumination in matter. A rather hybrid state of consciousness, which is present in all dimensional states and breeds the interdimensional gaps. My human life from early on sensitized me to pay attention to childhood without even knowing why. Between the age of 9 to 12, I was growing up as a runaway street kid. Between the ages of 16 to 19, I was a kind of homeless hitchhiking teenager in Europe, US and Africa. At the age of 18, I started babysitting. At the age of 19, I was working with children, designing dance costumes and arranging dance performances. At the age of 31, I ended up in a broken marriage, being a single parent of two kids, two and three year old. At the age of 36, I established what was called at the time, Healing Child Resort and Community, a project to nurture young children's healing, life education and community living. At the age of 52, I attempted two different orphanage projects, a local one in Thailand and a global one as a manual for anyone to implement. At the age of 55, I became a grandfather for a single second due to a stillbirth of my daughter's baby. That was probably the most um, incredible experience of my life and it will show up after what I'm, I've been sharing with you. Each time the depth of the experience was more profound. Since 2014, I've been launching and funding several small and large charitable children projects worldwide. Light has been guiding me with all these signposts along the way to pay attention to childhood and its importance, not personally or karmically, but in a wider sense. So let me share a few things with you in regard to childhood. Let's challenge some of our concepts about children. First of all, our children are not our children. They're not extension of our ego self and our illusionary desires, hopes and fears. They are independent, 
fully developed souls with a specific evolutionary journeys. Our ignorance and arrogance interferes with their soul's purpose. We can only love them to the extent we love and respect our inner self, our inner child. Children have always been the most harmed, oppressed, exploited, and helpless class of human beings throughout human history. We as adults believe that when children are born, they don't know anything and they need to be taught about life by us, the adults. The only thing an adult can teach a child is about human logistics, nothing more. Everything else is already known to the child. Life itself is a vehicle of education. By nature, children are curious, creative and intelligent beings. Teaching can only be in the form of humbly sharing our experiences and encourage children to explore and experiment in their own unique way. We adults constantly cripple children's confidence, creativity, passion and free spirit out of our ignorance, fear and insecurity. But we still pretend we want them to grow into independent, self-confident, powerful adults. Every child has an infinite wisdom in a body with just a little human experience. The role of each adult is to recognize and respect that wisdom and assist the child to grow and gain human experience without losing the connection with that infinite wisdom. Children come to this human dimension because they choose on a soul level to do just that. They have designed a very clear path that incorporates the two fundamental choices. One, the key people they will interact with, and two, the key experiences they have chosen to have in this human dimension. Childhood revolves to a significant degree around play. They may be biochemical reasons that instigate the need for play, or it may as well be that play itself instigate the biochemical changes observed in childhood. Life is child prioritized. The adults surrounding the children until about the age of seven have actually been somehow disabled from interfering with the creation of the environment chosen by the children's soul dimension. They need to leave them design their soul path as they have. And all the decisions that adults make during those early years of the children's lives cannot interfere with that soul path. Childhood represents our most joyful, free, creative, uninhibited, passionate, fulfilling, loving, enthusiastic, empowered, and present state of being. They are the purest reflection of life in human form. Every time we approach children with respect, we gain access to the vastness of cosmic wisdom. Children reflect infinite wisdom, awakening the adult's inner child, remind us what is essential and how to avoid becoming lost in a human experience. In terms of spiritual life and evolution, Children aren't simply equal to adults. 
they actually have a much greater potential than adults to heal and to teach us how to deal with the ongoing global vibrational shifts. We as adults need children to show us the way because they still remember how. They mirror our soul, our inner child. Our inner child knows too, although it's usually a quite painful experience for adults to allow full uninhibited expression of their inner child. Children are the key to the evolution of our species. They need to learn human experiences to serve their soul evolution. Adults need to remember why they have been learning the human experience. And we all need to cherish, nourish, harness, and protect childhood's vibrational frequency. Let's dig a bit deeper into the concepts of childbirth, creation, offering, light, and miracles. The term give birth in both Spanish and Portuguese languages is dar a luz, which means give or offer to the light, oriented towards the light. Dar does not only mean give, but also deliver, donate, offer. Linking the meaning of offering and donation with both the birth and the light. Behind the usual concepts of conception, pregnancy and birth, there is a much wider and deeper reality that relates to the miracle of life and the creation in its widest sense. It is a unique attunement process that resembles no other. In ancient Greek, the concept of giving and receiving are an expression of the same principle, donation. So could it be that giving birth is a donation from life to itself? Something has been given and received? Could illumination be a miracle? Is childhood and giving birth a miracle? In ancient Greek again, the word miracle means revelation, bringing to the light which again loops back to the meaning of birth as an offering to the light. So birth, creation, donation, sharing, offering to the light and miracle are all interlinked concepts. There's something about birth, death and immortality. Actually, illumination is immortal both outside of space-time as well as within it. The only difference is that within space-time and physical manifestation, the illumination's immortality is achieved via reproduction. Illumination is reproduced at almost perfect rate, meaning that early childhood sustains that illumination at the high level before degradation of adulthood and eventual death. Could it be possible that childhood is not part of the human program? That it doesn't have to do with the physical appearance of children, having a small body, etc., but rather with the illumination level frequency they meet as a field. Could it be that light itself transmits this frequency and the only or the best way we can pay attention to it is by being told the story, the story of the union of the male and female, which create a new being, a child, which we love and watch it grow. Could it be possible? behind the story 
of that union. There is the real message of the inner union. And that union creates a realization of the acknowledgement of illumination. Could it be that the result, the child, is that illumination acknowledgement? Could it be possible that the real message behind the child will watch grow could be the growth of illumination itself? It appears to me that childhood is illumination itself. It is how illumination impregnates time and space in order to sustain a certain defined range of illumination flowing to the human and animal programs. It is the implantation of illuminating energy that is required for the human and animal kingdoms and probably the plant kingdom because space and time erode its potency and degrade its quality. So, the constant conception, pregnancy, birth, and early childhood keeps renewing the overall energy field we experience with a frequency that vibrates through the human, animal, and plant kingdoms. Children's physical body is reciprocally equal to the etheric energy field they hold. This is why children have small bodies which are growing in terms of mass but are also, that also means that their etheric energy drops as their physical mass increases. When a baby is born, it has a weight equivalent to about 5% of its adult weight. It is 5% mass and 95% light. By the age of one, weight has been tripled, becoming 16%, of the average adult weight and still sustain 84% of the etheric field charge. By the age of 9 or 10, 15% of that field is converted into mass. By the age of 15 to 16, all of the etheric field has gone and converted into their adult weight. So, the younger we nurture children, the best chances there are they will be able to stretch in time that etheric field charge or being able to transmit it or being able to store it ethereally or even in DNA and replicate it. They may be even able to transmute it even though gets converted into mass. Not all mass is equal in terms of weight. Perhaps body mass can be hollower than usual. So physical mass can grow in terms of height and volume, but not necessarily weight. Physical body anyway, it's an expression of a certain light frequency. So, photon's frequency can be recalibrated, holding more light and less mass. It is the increasing gravitational forces that cause the loss of the etheric field. We still occupy the same overall energetic field, but the gravitation frequency is interchangeable with the etheric light frequency. What I've been sharing with you, it may not click at all, so you just ignore it. But for those of you who have asked to hear this, you may have been called to serve the light through a childhood archetypal. And you will be guided accordingly. Thank you so much for listening. Human communication is not just verbal. We frequently can communicate deeper through other senses. 
I will share with you an experience I've had in Kenya in one of the projects I've been supporting. The child you see on this video is an autistic boy who is also blind and mute. I've never seen this boy before those minutes which were spontaneously captured on this video. In fact, although I knew it was autistic, I had no idea that he was blind or deaf until I figured out a couple minutes later. This interaction has been the first and only interaction we both had with each other and it was totally spontaneous without, without any of us to know anything about the other one. Observe how he has been using touch, smell and sound and how this communication fulfills him with joy. Here is another example of reaching out and communicating with a stranger with simple movement. This clip was not rehearsed and the contact through movement was spontaneous. None of us knew what will happen, but we have opened up and listened to our pranic nature. Observe how this communication took place simply through our fingers. Hi guys, this is Mel again. Nicholas asked me to comment on COVID-19. So I will take the opportunity to share my views about it, as well as link it with the concepts of disease, life and death. Uh, forgive me, but I will have to put on my conspiracy hat on this one. Before COVID-19, 650,000 people have been dying yearly solely from the normal flu virus and no one made the big deal about it. People don't die from COVID-19. Statistically, over 90% of the deaths over, are over 65 years old and the other 
have had multiple or severe immune suppression conditions. Instead of supporting or placing in quarantine the aged and the sick, they have decided to quarantine 8 billion people, destroy the world economy, and cause immense long-term suffering among the entire world population, and all that just to prevent a few hundred thousand deaths which will be inevitable anyway. It is clearly serving a political, economic, social agenda. But if we're going to talk conspiracy theories, let's go all the way. So besides the obvious benefits for the big pharma companies and the medical establishment for testing, treatments and vaccinations, and the big conglomerates which will swallow assets and control globally, it would also recalibrate irreversibly the global financial payment system, the supply lines and the trading, and most importantly, the type of human interactions. Every person around us could be perceived as a potential threat. It has already been proven as a great tool towards mass population control and behavioral modifications and through this very new form of fear. In the past, they used nuclear holocaust, then terrorism, and now this is the virus pandemics. This is by far the smartest and the most successful fear mechanism so far. However, three years ago, I had a sudden vision of a potential sinister global scheme to, elim to eliminate uh, hundreds of millions of people over 65, as well as tens of millions of people aged 50 to 65, suffering chronic autoimmune conditions. That was not just a rational thought that passed through my mind. It was a complete vision. What I saw was not a possibility, but a complete reality. Perhaps a parallel reality, but nevertheless a very real one. Anytime I revisit this, I see the same picture. I feel that bringing this reality up in the open, it may vibrationally disrupt its unfolding and stay as a parallel reality rather than a manifested one that we collectively experience. So this is the reason why I'm sharing this and put it out in the open. But let me elaborate a little bit on how and why such a scheme could be activated. So both the healthcare system and the pension system in most countries is bankrupt, has massive liabilities and there are no ways to resolve them. The longer lifespans, combined with the low birth rates and the rapidly reduced younger labor forces, have created an unsustainable system, both in healthcare as well as the pension systems, public and private. In the past, immigration could fill up the gap, but recently there's been a global immigration last back. The final factor is that the baby boomer generation has accumulated a tremendous amount of wealth, of which only a small fraction flows into the system, and it's not passed to the next generations due to the very to the ever extended lifespan of this generation. So the combination of those four factors is basically bankrupt in the capitalist system. Swift deaths within a couple of weeks is a very efficient way to relieve the global economic system from its massive liabilities. Why surprised? There have been repeated similar schemes of depopulation, whether by mass forced sterilizations, one-child policies, vaccinations, and of course, wars. However, usually these schemes were targeting children and young men, 
because they were plentiful. The old at those times did not live that long and they did not demand much. Now, demographically speaking, the situation is reversed. The obstacle are the old, not the young, for the first time, and the biggest, most urgent obstacle is the baby boomer generation, which is the most extensive one in numbers. So, no matter how pervasively evil and far-fetched that may sound, if we step back and rationally observe it, it makes perfect sense, and any decision maker on that level would have to seriously consider it and test it. I believe that COVID-19 was such a test, preparing for a series of upcoming pandemics targeting the aged and immune compromised. But who knows, maybe I'm just crazy. Anyway, getting back to the COVID-19, the two, more, two main points I'm trying to make uh, is one, that people have been routinely dying from flu viruses since ever. And two, people have been dying from a myriad of causes related to a compromised immune system and not due to any virus which are harmless to everyone else. But let's go and view this whole thing from a, a different perspective. Our entire physical life is linked to neurotransmitters. Every, everything else is secondary. We don't stay alive because of what we eat or drink or breathe. This is the results of neurotransmitter actions. All decisions are occurring on that neurotransmitter level. Prana, light, chi, enters the body through the pineal gland and activates the hypothalamus, which in turn triggers the, the pituitary gland, which controls the nervous and the endocrine system. The entire endocrine system is controlled by the thymus gland, which is the core of the immune system. What I'm trying to say with this is that when the immune system malfunctions, it happens only because the pineal gland has authorized it, for reasons that lay on the pranic dimension and the soul consciousness level and not on the human consciousness level. In any case, viewing it from a deeper perspective, I believe there is no such a thing as what we call disease. There is nothing external that can cause disease without our consent. Nothing can happen in the universe without consent. Disease is simply our pretension and our denial of our deeper soul choice path. And healing is the acceptance and recognition of that choice path. So in a way, everything is a healing process, no matter if it is conscious or unconscious. Now let's explore death a little bit. What is really death? Every cell in our body die and new cells are born. Every organ has a lifespan. The limits of life and death are so arbitrary. It is a medical belief that three days without food and water cause irreversible system collapse and imminent death. So, how breatharians stay alive? Death is something we have learned to fear, bear its existence, constantly choose to pretend that it's not part of our life. This fundamental fear distorts not only death significance, but also life significance. Our exercising of death prohibits us to live fully. It is interesting to dissect the fear of death. 
That fear exists until imminent death becomes a certainty. Fear is about the uncertainty of an outcome, not the outcome itself. We're not really afraid of death, but rather its possibility, its possible implications, the unknown time and circumstances, whether there would be pain and suffering involved, whether we would be surprised by its timing, and so on. So, when the outcome becomes certain, initially denial would run its course until acceptance of what is replaces that denial. That certainty of death, as well as certainty of anything else, brings liberation from the fear because it dissolves the uncertainty and brings peace. In any case, no human being can die without signing a soul contract. No matter if we remember it or not, that's how it works. Death is not what we believe. We as humans are only aware of our existence and the existence of the others around us as long as we are tuned in into a certain vibrational frequency. A vibrational frequency adjustment towards a higher octave causes ascension and towards a lower frequency octave causes disintegration and death. So, in a way, we either explode or implode. But our, our identity as light beings does not change. The change of death is only an experience of our human vibrational limits. We're actually dying and being born every fraction of a second. We even know the exact number, called the Planck constant. We cannot humanly, per humanly perceive it. It is a fundamental law of the interaction of the electromagnetic, the gravitational and levitational fields that bends space and time. In quantum physics, this is fully understood. So the cause of what we call death is not due to any external circumstances, such as viruses, accidents, but due to a shift of vibrational frequency, and it's always chosen. Not necessarily within our human perception, but this is always chosen. Nothing can happen in the universe without consent. Recognizing the existence of that consent builds trust and peace. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Mel again. Let's talk about adaptation towards the pranic state. Pranic consciousness creates soul consciousness to express its essence in, into creation and listen back to how that creation unfolds and interacts. The soul dimension communicates with our human dimension through our human body and mind. Almost everything our human body and mind experience is a holographic game version of what soul consciousness choose to experience. The human consciousness is a shared platform for soul consciousness. Not an independent soul, because there are no independent separate souls. The perception that we are different souls interacting with each other in a never-ending karmic loop is an illusion. There are no different separate souls interacting with one another. This is the result of what we call the light diffraction and infraction. That causes this misconception in our space dimension. The entire soul consciousness is an energy field vibrating in a certain frequency range. 
and areas of the soul field detect particular areas of the human field that can serve as chosen vehicles of this soul energy expression. It is like a notion of soul consciousness expressing itself through a notion of human consciousness. The different waves or colors or depths or reflections of that ocean does not make its droplets any different in their nature. And that applies to both the soul and the human fields. The human body is not just important. It is our physical gate to the pranic consciousness. The entire storehouse of the pranic consciousness is in the body. It is already downloaded and just waits activation. Both the pranic and the soul dimensions communicate with the human mind through the body. The soul dimension speaks through the body, expressing how it feels, seeking recognition of that speaking. The pranic dimension penetrates the body with prana through the pineal gland, activating the neurotransmitter system. That system regulates both the endocrine and nervous systems and triggers the chain reaction of the entire human experience. At both physical as well as energetic level, we need purification. The deeper the purification, the stronger we awaken that inner pranic state. Fasting, either water fasting or very diluted fruit juices or vegetable juices is a great preparation for breatharianism or liquidarianism. There is a common physiological denominator behind liquidarianism, behind water fasting, behind dry fasting, and behind breatharianism. And that is that they all trigger a state of physiological ketosis. For those of you not familiar with ketosis, it is a physiological state during which the body looks for fuel by burning fat cells instead of glucose. It starts with disease cells and continues to repairing semi-functional ones. It also, during dry fasting, without liquids or water, it creates structured water from the burning of those cells. And that water is the optimal water source for cell repair and cell reproduction. Therefore, you can experiment with fasting, liquid darianism, and for more magnified spiritual results, when you choose to eat, you better stay on a keto diet. Keto diet is based on sourcing fuel at least 75% from lipids, fat, about 20% from protein, and only 5% from carbohydrates. Let me make clear that I don't mean the usual craze of the temporary keto diets that focus on weight loss. These diets miss the true point of the spiritual vibrational importance of ketosis. I mean to use ketosis as the platform of a deep and irreversible consciousness transformation. Basically eliminating for the majority of the time the carbohydrates from your diet eliminates glucose as the default source of fuel for the production of ATP, which is what we live on, physiologically speaking. About two days without carbohydrates 
trigger the state of ketosis. Glucose appears to be mostly responsible for the majority of autoimmune conditions, but most importantly appears to be the core vibrational substance which perpetuates the human vibrational limitation, trapping our, limit, our unlimited pranic consciousness into a narrow frequency band. Glucose is also a key component that perpetuates sexual desire as a way to sustain and perpetuate human consciousness. In a nutshell, glucose is behind our cravings for food and sex, which are the two most powerful drives of our usual human existence. I have found that establishing a firm state of ketosis through diet, non-glucose liquids, water fasting or dry fasting can serve as perhaps the most efficient tool towards the recognition and adaptation towards a breatharian pranic state. I now would like to address the importance of hydrogen. It has been a well-accepted scientific fact that any source of what we call life requires the presence of water, meaning hydrogen and oxygen. Let's explore a little the nature of water. We have been told that water is H2O. However, the nature of water is much more complex and always involves clusters of many more atoms of hydrogen and oxygen, especially when it is structured, meaning geometrically balanced. The proportion of two atoms of hydrogen versus one atom of oxygen to describe the nature of water seems at the best naive. Anyway, Almost nothing in nature has this proportion 2 to 1. Most things in nature comply with what we call the golden ratio, the phi number of 1.618 and its multiples or divisions. If we follow that phi rule, the most likely scenario is that the proportion of the hydrogen and oxygen is 2.618 versus 1. Practically, that would mean 34 atoms of hydrogen versus 13 atoms of oxygen, following also the Fibonacci sequence, which is 1, 1, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. If accidentally or intentionally we don't have access to carbohydrates and glucose, the body utilizes as energy sources protein through a process called glyconeogenesis or through fat through a process called ketosis. And that's how it creates ATP. In all the above, hydrogen is the key element. So the question comes to mind, what if our bodies do not actually need carbohydrates, proteins or lipids, but they actually look for hydrogen? And of course they find it in all these three sources. I sense that we can consciously and intentionally tap into that internal hydrogen source during a dry fast or during a fully fledged breatharian state. The mechanics of that activation probably involve the cellular respiration, the presence of water inside and outside the cells and the electrical charges taking place between them. 
that activation can be generated by the light photons themselves. The most probable frequency and gates in that activation of hydrogen should be the infrared. The infrared frequency excites the hydrogen bonds and creates energy. Infrared is the spectrum of creation from which springs growth and reproduction. Far infrared frequency is also emitted from our bodies. We are in fact light generators, prana generators. Light and prana are not external sources to us. We are also a source. Everything is a source. Keep in mind that Bertharianism is not a goal. It is a tool to develop trust and acknowledgement of the pranic light state of existence. There are other ways to deeply awaken the light field within the human existence. I have personally experimented for long periods of time and integrated tools such as meditation, dancing, qigong, ayahuasca, oxygen and ozone therapies, lots of body and vibration field therapies, urine therapy, sensory isolation and floating, prolonged silence, nootropics, prolonged and complete celibacy, and have found value to all of them. However, I have learned valuable lessons from these experimentations, understanding that it's not what you do, but why. The why always sets the tone for the experience. Having said all that, I consider Breatharianism as one of the most powerful and transformative tools. It may or may not be for you. But even if you briefly experiment with it, it can take you a long way on this path. The light pranic dimension is a complete alive world, which is simply interacting and communicating with our third dimension, because our third dimension consciousness paid attention to it, observed it, and recognized that pranic dimension. Once this pranic existence has been recognized, its manifestation becomes inevitable. Actually, we don't engage individually with the light source and its sub-realities. It is a collective engagement of the entire range of frequencies. Any sense of individuality is an illusion of the human program. It is not us as humans going towards the light. It is the light as an operating platform system that downloads from its cloud diverse software programs like our collective soul consciousness into hosting hardware like our individual human body minds Therefore, our identity is not our human hardware and is not our soul consciousness software, but it is our pranic consciousness dancing through all dimensions. And speaking about dancing, let me close my sharing with a lighter, upbeat video clip. Enjoy and thank you for listening. Joy is something that can be shared even with strangers and is contagious. We all crave for it because it reconnects us with our true pranic nature.
This is a spontaneous invitation to dance with each other in the middle of a city street, overcoming our inhibitions and let ourselves be like children enjoying the magnificence of life.